start um, in a project. Oh, here we go. Yeah. I got okay, it. now now we're recording. Okay, great. So welcome everyone, whether you're here with us live or in the recording. Um, again, my name is Carly Lover and I'm on the education team at National Geographic. And we're here today to talk about the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative. Um, so as you saw in the email, this is the first ever snapshot of plastic pollution along the river. Uh, we piloted this last spring in St. Paul, St. Louis, and Baton Rouge, and we're so thrilled to be uh, working in the Quad Cities this fall. It's going to be amazing. Um, this webinar today is specifically for educators, um, both formal and out of school educators, and we're really looking forward to having you and your students join us and contribute to this effort. So we hope that uh, the kids will learn a lot and also have a great time being citizen scientists. Um, so this went out in the email, but I'm going to drop our participant agenda into the chat if folks want to follow along there. That also went out in the email I sent. Um, it has links to everything we're going to reference today. So all the websites, all of the Google Docs, everything you need will be uh, in that participant agenda if you want to open that up. And as you can see from the, agenda, from the agenda, we're going to do a brief overview of the project. Uh, you'll be getting a tutorial on how to use Debris Tracker. We'll share some education specific resources. Um, you'll hear from two educators about their experience participating in this project. Um, and we'll share some social media assets with you. So that's our plan for today. Um, but before we get started, we do have a great group of project partners on the call um, that I'd like to briefly introduce. Um, again, I'm Carly from National Geographic, and we have uh, Katie Lodes and Britt Bogard, two amazing teachers from the St. Louis area, uh, who participated in the pilot uh, this past spring, so we're really excited to have them. From the United Nations Environment Program, we have Jane Eisenhardt, who's helping coordinate the project and who will be talking to you about social media a bit later. Uh, we're so thrilled to have Jenna Jimbeck, Distinguished Professor of Environmental Engineering at the University of Georgia um, and a National Geographic Explorer. She's uh, done incredible work uh, literally all over the world tracking plastic pollution in waterways. And she's also the scientist who will be using the data that you and your students collect to really make a positive impact. Um, and last but not least, Jenny went from the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, uh, who does amazing work coordinating this project with cities and organizations all along the river. Um, let's see, at this point, Jenny, I'm going to hand it over to you to give an overview of the project. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And I won't be able to see you, so somebody needs to tell me if it works. Let's see this. All, All right. good so far. Okay, good. All right, so this is, I've done this a million times, so I'm gonna do it again. This is the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative. I, am, I work for MRCTI, Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, and we are partnering with the University of Georgia, the UN Environment Program, and supported by National Geographic Society. On this, uh, the image on your screen shows the Mississippi River watershed in the upper part of the hourglass. And as you can see, this watershed goes all the way from Montana, past Ohio, all the way down. Everything that hits the ground, every drop of water go, ends up in the Mississippi River to the Gulf and to the ocean. Unfortunately, so does a lot of plastic pollution because plastic pollution easily travels through storm drains and tributaries to the Mississippi River, out to the Gulf, and to the ocean. I think a lot of people think of ocean plastics as being a coastal problem or an ocean problem, but really here we are in the middle of the country and we are also can make an impact, good or bad, on the problem. Um, 
A little bit about MRCTI. Um, all the Quad City mayors are uh, part of MRCTI. It's an association of United States mayors. There are 101 mayors of cities located along the Mississippi River. Um, there are five pillars, uh, pillar programs that MRCTI focuses on, clean water, sustainable economies, disaster resilience and adaptation, international food and water security, and celebration of river culture, history, and heritage. And of course, the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative falls under the clean water program. I'm going to play a short video for you about that kind of gives an overview about the initiative. I love the video. And so I am going to play it now, but I think I have to share a different screen. So hold on. Where is it? Okay, I need to go here. Oops. Nope. Sorry about this. Thought I had it pulled up, apparently not. Okay. The Mississippi River flows over 2,000 miles through the heartland of America, from its headwaters in Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico. This river is the watershed for 32 states, and we are impacting it with our actions. The litter that we produce from coffee cups to masks or plastic bags can end up in the environment, making their way to our rivers and then into the oceans. Globally, this results in about a dump truck's worth of plastic entering our ocean every minute. The Mississippi River drains 40% of the continental United States, creating a conduit for our litter to reach the Gulf of Mexico. In September 2018, the mayors of the Mississippi River made a commitment to reduce plastic waste in the Mississippi River Valley. To support that commitment, the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative is working with volunteer citizen scientists, local communities, associations, and researchers to collect data to understand the magnitude of the plastics problem along the Mississippi River. Scientists need data on what's ending up in the environment so that we can use that information to address this important environmental problem. And you can be a part of the solution. Download the free Marine Debris Tracker app and choose the list entitled MRCTI to collect data on what plastic pollution looks like in your community. The data will be analyzed to help us understand the problem which then leads to solutions that will help policymakers, businesses, and citizens alike take action. Join us today to ensure a clean river and clean seas for all. Okay, um, I'm gonna share a couple more slides real quick and then I will um, go back. Okay. All right, so um, so basically we, what MRCTI did is we, we joined forces with um, the United Nations Environment Program, the University of Georgia, and with support from National Geographic so Society to come up with a plan to create a plastic pollution snapshot because we realized we really didn't have enough data to be able to um, do what we needed to do to reduce. We needed to know what, how, where plastics were making their way to the river. So the cities that have committed right now in the Quad Cities, Bettendorf, Davenport, Riverdale, East Moline, Moline, Rock Island, and Coal Valley, have all um, committed, the mayors have committed to this initiative to collect the data, look, we'll create a report, and then to analyze, after we analyze that data, we can determine what actions need to happen in the cities to, to reduce this plastic waste and to prevent it from making its way to the, to the waterways. 
And we'll do this using the Marine Debris Tracker, which Jenna will talk about. Um, you probably all received the flyer on the left and I'll sure I'll send that out again. It's very simple um, to collect data. We'd like to go through these classes to kind of give, or this training to kind of let people talk about it and to get an overall idea of what, what the initiative is. Um, because basically, you know, when the students collect data, they can see what they've accomplished, they can see what the groups accomplished, and they can see what the communities accomplished and everybody along the Mississippi River um, as far as what data is out there. It's fantastic. And that is the end of mine. I will put my email address in the chat um, so that you all can get a hold of me if you have any questions at all about any of it. All right, thanks, Jenny. You're welcome. And uh, let's pass it over to Jenna to talk about Debris Tracker. Hi, everyone. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, give sort of our somewhat typical training, but um, at the same time, I think this sort of, it doesn't assume, but you know, oftentimes people have their own device, um, but I know for students that may not be the case or a teacher might be using one device for the whole class and all that's fine. And I will talk about sort of those modifications um, as we go through the training and uh, I'm sure Britt and Katie have a lot of insight to share. So um, first of all, we'll just talk about what is Debris Tracker. It's a mobile app for tool, how to use the app, um, the specific surveying protocols that we um, designed for the program. I, I'm also going to offer modifications. Um, I started feeling right now that I'm like, I don't know, I take online exercising. And I was like, there's modifications. You can, <laughs> all kinds of modifications you can do to the exercise. So that's pretty much what this is. It's like ways to modify the protocols. Um, and so and those are number four. So other ways to also collect data. Okay. So what is Debris Tracker? Debris Tracker is actually 10 years old. It was originally developed here at the University of Georgia, funded by NOAA, our, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, through a grant. Um, it's had some other partners since then, um, but most recently, I think National Geographic and uh, Morgan Stanley as sort of an eternal funding partner. So that will eternal, I should say longer term. Um, and then of course, supported by the university as well to hopefully um, it's, it's very sustainable in terms of living here and the data living here. So um, we have over 5 million reports now around the world. And the last time I gave this talk, it was 4 million. So we have crossed that threshold. Tracking has occurred in nearly a hundred countries around the world. People are reporting data. This is basically an app to report litter that you see on the ground or in the water. Um, either are appropriate. Um, its nickname is Debris Tracker now so that people don't think they can only use it on the water or on the coastline. And in fact, for this, we highly encourage, and you'll see the map, encouraging people to track in urban areas. And that's how we use the tool. Um, what I think is most sort of, I think, rewarding and exciting and motivating about this app is that, yes, we analyze the data, but guess what? We don't own the data. Nobody owns this data. It is free and open to everyone. So any data that you collect, you have immediate access to and everybody has immediate access to in terms of looking at the big picture. Um, of course, usernames are stripped when it's completely public, but otherwise um, we really believe in open data and sharing of that and making sure that everyone has access to this data. So um, that's important. And it also means you have an amazing way as an educator to collect data, look at that data, compare that data to data in other locations, download a bigger data set. Um, there's just all kinds of things you know, that you can do. And this is the data portal where you can see charts and take screenshots by filtering the data, but you can also um, download it into an Excel spreadsheet, you know, so sort of more advanced analyses. Um, you can also use Google Sheets, you know, other free spreadsheet programs. So I think sort of the way um, we talk about this and how we think of, of guiding our data collection. And the reason we have a list that's fairly specific with what we ask people to collect data on 
is because we kind of have these three guiding questions. I love that flyer because it says, want to be, you know, a debris detective. And it's really, um, we're specific about what we see because we want to try to figure out how did it get here? Whether it be looking around for influencing factors and there's a survey at the end of the data collection to kind of talk about land use and things that you might see around you. Um, and also clues with the item itself. We also ask people to collect a brand um, for this project. And the specific item really helps inform how did this item get here? And then of course, when we have all the data together, um, we, you, everybody can take you know, their own data. What can we do about this? If we feel like we need to do something, we can come together around that data and talk about what we may want to do. Um, okay, so more specifics on how to use the app. Since some of these screenshots were taken, the app looks a little different. It's had an upgrade and update. Um, as hardware updates very quickly, new phones come out, um, the app needs updating. And also this was, it was helpful visually. So when you uh, first log into the app, you, it will ask you to make an account. I want you to know accounts can be shared. So you could make an account just as an educator and that account could be shared with students if you if nobody wants to have individual accounts, you can just have one account and you can share it. Um, the specific list you heard in the video is um, MRCTI, but it's actually called the Mississippi River Plastic Pollution Initiative. Now we're trying to uh, give it, you know, sort of the whole initiative name, but also says MRCTI. Um, so here you can see the name of the list right there. Um, so Catherine had been logged in right there, but here's the list of lists. So as you go back, um, you'll pick on this and then you'll pick this Mississippi River list and it will immediately show you the top trackers, um, which is quite amazing. So you can, you know, like some of your team members could um, get on this list at some point as well. Um, then it will go into, are you sure you want this list? You can say, yep. And then there you have, sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the app and the list of all the items um, that we would like people to log um, if they see. And it also collapses into these categories. So um, if it is, you know, plastic, then you can kind of collapse all these and then you can open up plastic and just see plastic items. PPE is separate than that. So that's the personal protective equipment, um, masks, gloves, wipes, things like that are in that category. Um, we'll just see her go through. I'd like to pause this and kind of give an explanation. Well, there you go. She opened up PPE. Um, those are the items there. You just click on the item. Um, when you see it, you can search if you're looking for an item. So she was looking for bottle. So at the top, you can start typing in bottle and it will bring up everything that um, has bottled. There would be plastic beverage bottles, glass bottles. Um, and see right here, we ask for brand. So when you click on the item itself, it opens up this description box um, and you can type in the brand if you're able to identify that or can take the time to do that. If you're just adding it as is, you can hit this add button or you can hit plus or minus and this will count up. But let's say you have a hundred cigarette butts. Um, sometimes there's a big pile of those. You can actually click on this number and type in um, the number of items that you see. So um, again, this brand box is actually free typing. So if there's anything else you want to note besides brand, you can type in there. Um, in the other category, we have you type in the, um, the description of what it is. So if you ever log, so each category, so see she's showing in each one of those categories, there's another item because we don't have every plastic item in the world there. We don't have every paper item in the world there. So if there's something that's not on the list, you go into other. And if you click on, again, click right there, it will open up a description box and you can type in what that other thing was. Um, again, if you can discern it. Um, pretty much everything, if you can tell what it was, we like you to log it as that item because that gives us those hints of how that item got there. Um, you know, why that item ended up there. So if it's a piece of a food wrapper, but you can tell it's a food wrapper, we have you log it as a food wrapper as opposed to um, a fragment of plastic. If it's a fragment that you can't tell what it was, then you log that as a fragment. Um, what she's logging right here is an accumulation area. If you had a blanket of trash on the ground, um, couldn't count 
all the items, you can estimate the size of this accumulation area um, and enter that and it enters a course. Every time you enter these, it automatically time, date, and GPS coordinates of these items. If you wanna practice, um, go ahead and look for the test item and you can enter that, you know, wherever sitting at your desk or wherever you want to just kind of practice using the app. And if you submit those, obviously, we don't use those in the data analysis. Um, yeah, so then you can hit um, manage items and um, continue. So if you hit manage, you're able to look at the map of items that you've logged as well as click on individual items to delete them. Um, and so that's what she's doing right now, clicked on manage items. And if you um, want to delete something, it will ask if you're sure so that you don't accidentally delete something. Um, and then you can go back to logging. You can go back to that screen and then you can continue and it will go to this small survey when you're done. So we're, I'll talk about the protocols in a minute, but typically people will be tracking for 30 minutes or so or whatever time you have to be able to give. And then you, um, you answer that little survey at the end of your tracking session. You can upload photos. That's what she's doing right now is adding a few photos. Um, we don't recommend doing lots of photos, maybe just if there's a specific strange item um, or maybe if there was a haul at the end you wanted to show, but it's, um, it takes time to upload those. And so, we just, you know, just like if you're uploading lots of pictures to Facebook or something. So um, you can always, of course, take pictures on your phone and have them there. So um, that's that. Jenna, sure. there was a question. Yes. Can you yes. take a question? Let's stop. Of course. Yes. yes. Thank you. John, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. So I think this is awesome. Uh, I, I love the, the flexibility with that app. I'm just curious, do you guys ever use like a inventory checklist to try to like fill out as you go, but then go back into the app and fill it in so that we're not entering each individual one, but kind of like make tally marks or, I mean, I, I haven't pulled it up on my phone just yet, but I'm seeing it on your screen. It just, uh, for ease of use, is that something you guys do? Yep. Yeah, that is one of the modifications, John. So yes, yes, we do. And if that is the way you prefer to do things, you may absolutely do that. So I will I will give you some more detail on that in a minute, and I'm so I'm really glad you asked that because I'm we have that specifically because people have asked for it before. So um, okay. this is a, just a little hint for settings um, to have your precise location on because that helps pinpoint the items if you are tracking in real time um, with the GPS. So I'll talk about the protocols and talk about the potential ways that those can be modified and still contribute to the data set. Um, so what we're going to do is have you record um, items that are one inch in diameter at least. Um, and I, again, if they can be identified, uh, I kind of mentioned about the fragmentation, please identify them brand um, using the other entering description. So this is kind of just a summary of many of the things that I uh, described earlier. And I always forgot at the end, if you're interested in sharing on social media, you can tag Debris Tracker uh, on Twitter, also on Facebook and share, you know, what your accomplishment was. Um, okay, so the way we have outlined um, in terms of how where you go to track for sort of the official randomized transect is we have a grid across the sea and I will pull up the Quad Cities map. This is an example from St. Paul, just to show you. Um, and basically this is a Google map. So it's not within the app. Um, that is something that I think has caused some confusion in the past, but this is a Google map that you could even go to before you even start tracking or do anything. You can play with this Google map. Um, in fact, well, no, I'll show it at the end. I will show you the Quad Cities and we can look at it. And you can figure out where you want to go. You can even pick an address, pick one of these squares, and then, you know, before you even leave home. You can, of course, also open this Google map on your phone and navigate in the field. But I think that got confusing for some people who thought this map was in the app, which is not. Um, so what we ask in the transect method, if you navigate to one of those yellow squares or opportunistically right outside your school, in your schoolyard, wherever, if you want to um, follow the transect protocol, you walk and record all the litter that you see 
in about a meter's width, which is about from the tip of your fingers to about your midline of your body. Um, and we ask to try to go for half an hour. Again, a modification would be go for a shorter time. You know, whatever, whatever fits. My son has a 20 minute recess. If they were gonna do this over recess, they might be able to go for 10 minutes. That's fine. Um, and also if the kids just want to spread out across, you know, school grounds in a different way, that works. But the protocol for the randomized transects is a meter wide and walking for 30 minutes. Um, and so from here, we also have an opportunity for people to collect data on floating debris. So this was kind of really interesting the first time you stand either on a bridge or um, safely on the riverbank. Again, I wanna stress um, actually, you know, showing those pictures before in terms of the transects, you know, they're walking pathways. Um, the survey at the end says, you know, did you log along the side of the road, along a gutter, a curb? sidewalk and safety first. Do not do anything ever that is not safe for any reason that comes first by far. Um, but if you want to collect floating debris, you stare at a location in the river, the same location and count anything that passes by for 15 minutes. Um, and again, the survey at the end clarifies what activity you just did. Okay, so getting uh, to John's question and other ways you can modify. Like I said, you can really track anywhere at any time, whether it's the schoolyard um, and however works, depending upon the age, when my son was two. Um, so yeah, I think uh, Britt said she does preschool through five art. So as two, I had two and three-year-olds out tracking, of course, they didn't hold the phones, but they of course were pointing out trash on the ground and we logged it all together. Um, very different than, you know, fifth and sixth graders or high schoolers that go out, but anything that's convenient, all of this data, is helpful to the project and will feed into it in terms of top items, what people are finding, what people are concerned about. Um, we do recommend if you do the transects, it's, it's easiest to do that in pairs. So if you think about doing a cleanup, um, which oftentimes people want to clean up as well um, when they're doing these transects, one person picking up the material and one person tracking works quite well. Um, and also somebody can be kind of eyes watching because as you are tracking, you're often looking at your phone. Um, but another way, so I think John, this is what you're talking about. You can do an aggregated tracking on location. Well, this is not exactly what you're talking about. Uh, yours is the next one, but this modification is if everybody wants to clean up first and just put it in one location and then you sit in that location and enter the data just realize if you use the app, what it will look like is all of those items are in that exact location. That's fine, it's not a transect, the data will be used, it will be entered, but it will appear as, as if it's just in one location if you aggregate it all and then enter it. Um, that happens and a lot of people, like this is a small island off Miami, they did a big cleanup, sorted it all and entered it all in one location. Um, now John asked if you would like to do like clipboards and checklists and you know not everyone has a phone which is very much true would be like at my son's school then you would have a paper data card paper data cards are available they're on debris slash mississippi we can drop that in the chat um, you can use paper data cards still work in pairs or however works for you and then you can enter the data manually on computers later. That'd be something you could do as the educator or students could do, depending upon you know, age appropriate. Um, and so you can go ahead and, and do that. So I think there's lots of options on sort of how to do this. Another way, um, like when I was working with the younger kids, I, there was just like three adults that had phones and then a bunch of kids running around kind of collecting data and telling you about it. So um, as I said, safety first, all of these, um, safety tips are in both the video, the guide. Here we go over them. Um, they have been made since COVID, so it talks a lot about sanitation and not touching your face, um, not picking up anything hazardous, that kind of thing. But we don't tell anyone that they have to pick up at all. That is 100% personal choice. Um, it does not be participate in the research. You do not have to actually pick up the litter because that's um, but we did have the survey and 83% of people did pick up the letter last time. So my last part, um, thank you for bearing with me, is to share the, um, the map. 
so you can see that. Oops. Not sure. Okay. So this is the, um, that doesn't look like the map that I can zoom in on. Oop. I shared the PowerPoint again, sorry. There we go. It's the end of the day. It's after five here. I'm, I'm good. Just been busy. Okay. So um, you can see all the different little yellow squares. It might be overwhelming. There's no way we will get to all these yellow squares. Um, what does happen, what's really cool though, the point of this is to spread people out. So when enough data is collected, these, these are 200 by 200 meter yellow squares that are inside a one kilometer square that you can't see, but we have gridded in GIS. And so um, when there's an equal to 300 meters of transect collected in a square, it turns blue. And then people know, oh, that's accomplished and that's done and then we can move to a different location so that way we don't get everybody going to the same location to track um, for the transect method again the cleanup and you know schoolyard and other ease collections can be um, you know done in different ways i know um, one educator that i ended up chatting with had a few students that she did some transects with because they wanted to kind of go over and above and otherwise just use the app sort of around where they were at school and whatnot, but was able to take like a little field trip with two or three students that were really motivated to want to do this transect method as well. So there's so much flexibility. Um, I'm happy to take more questions. Are there more questions, Carly, or? Um, yeah, any, any questions? I, I guess one question I would ask is, Jenna, where can folks find this map of the transects? It should be linked in the user guide, which is now on the debris tracker website. Um, so on the debris tracker.org slash Mississippi. Yeah, so, I'll share it. I'll share it as well. Um, and so many of the things I said were in, in that guide as well. Scroll down. We probably will also release a bottle in Quad Cities, but this guide, this guide should be the updated guide, so it should have the updated link in there for the map. So that was a great question. All right, any other questions for Jenna about debris tracker um, or data collection before we move on to um, education specific resources? Perfect. I and I apologize, I may have to duck out early. Oh, so there's a email debris tracker um, 101 at Gmail. Um, but sorry, John, were you going to say something? Just yeah, real quick. Um, and I'm, I apologize, I, I'm assuming you covered this. But so within each plot, right, there are a number of transects. Is that something the app is going to identify where you are within that uh, larger zone? You know, if it Right, it's since they're like a, a meter wide is what we're tracking. Uh, how do we how do we like fill in the different transects? Yeah, so it's not within the app. Um, we're not we're not advanced to that stage yet. I would I would love that because that's what a lot of people are thinking now. Ooh, yes, I can open the app and it's the one stop shop. But it's in Google Maps, so that's why we said you could open up that map before and kind of locate where you want to go if you want to try to go to some of those yellow squares. Um, but in the and then you just can get an address from there, or you can open that map in Google Maps. You know, just like you're navigating to you know a new restaurant that you haven't been to, you just kind of can open that up. You can see the yellow squares, you can pinpoint it, and then get directions to it. Um, and in that yellow square, I should have to say it's 200 by 200 meters, so you actually have a bunch of choices once you get there. You want to pick like a sidewalk. Um, a path, something that is really an area that's safe for walking. And that is also where we call litter aggregation pathways. And so that's what that transect really is. It's, it's, it's almost when you get there, you're like, wow, haven't I noticed this before? But you will see the edges of roads, the edges of sidewalks, um, areas, you know, that, that people often do their daily, you know, walks and commutes and things is where the litter is. And that's where you walk for, um, as long as you can, 30 minutes if possible, and collect and count every item in that 
one meter wide part, which is just that sort of guesstimate measurement from your hand out. So um, it's kind of left up to you. There's a lot of flexibility there just to make sure people can do it safely. Um, and it is Google Maps and then, or whatever mapping software that your phone pulls up. But yeah, these are in Google. And then you open the app. Once you're ready in your transect to start tracking, that's when you can open the app and start logging. All right, great question. Any other questions for Jenna? Britt says it's way easier than it sounds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, it's kind of a simple, but then when you, <laughs> it really is easy. Why does it sound so complex, Britt? I want to hear. It's one yeah. of those things. I think it's one of those. Well, first of all, it's way nicer than it was when we all learned how to do it. I don't even know when that was, Jenny, like that we all like sat and learned it the first time. The app is like drastically easier than it even was Yay. in the beginning. It was really clunky in the beginning and now it's much more user friendly um, because I remember in the beginning I had to figure out, I had to scroll through all the things to find my organization and stuff like that. And it was a little overwhelming. Um, so the new one is really user friendly and I really like that there's pictures now with it. Um, but it's one of those things where you have to just play with it to really figure it out. And like, you know, you just play with it and then you get it. And then you go to the website version of it and you're like, whoa, it's even nicer. Cause I'm just used to it on my app. And then, um, so, you know, I just found that as I tinkered with it, I also found that kids knew how to use it way better than I did. So if you just they give it, it through, just give it to a 10 to 17 year old and you're fine. You don't even have to know how to use it because they will. I love that. That is so true. The other thing that you'll like, Britt, is there's a favorites now. So the you can star the items that you most commonly see. And I forgot to, to um, say that when I was talking it through it. But yeah, so like food, I mean, number one items or top five food wrappers, beverage bottles, cigarette butts. Um, you know, sometimes cups are in there. So various things, but you can star a few of those and they're right at the top and they're like what you commonly see. And then you can kind of look at the other things in the nested list. But yeah, I love the kids lead the way. 100%, absolutely. Um, all right, so thanks guys. And, and, you know, Quad City educators, you are benefiting from, uh, you know, the the first pilot educators and what they learned and um, you'll contribute as this thing grows. So um, hopefully not only will this be a great thing for you and your students, but then you'll be contributing to the project um, as it builds. Um, so let's move now to thinking about um, how you sort of translate this project into learning uh, for your students. So I'm going to go just real briefly over a few education resources we have for you. Um, there are three main links. They're all in your participant agenda. Um, first, I'm going to go through um, some of the resources we have from National Geographic, and I'll, that's in your participant agenda, and I'll also post it um, here in the chat. Um, so if you want to open that up, and as Jenna mentioned, National Geographic is one of the supporters of Debris Tracker. So on our education uh, site, we have a lot of supporting materials um, to help with the use of Debris Tracker. So if you want to follow along with me for a bit and click on the first link called Debris Tracker Landing Page, um, as you can see, there's a lot to explore here. This is sort of a landing site um, for all things uh, Debris Tracker um, at National Geographic Education. So if you scroll through, you'll see links to articles, interactives, videos, um, uh, you know, entire collections of instructional materials. So we won't have time to go through all of that, of course, but if you want to spend some time to serve exploring this landing page um, and the resources that are there. Um, if you head back to the resources doc, you'll see there are a few other links in that debris tracker section that we wanted to highlight, especially the 
Plastic Pollution Action Journal. So that's a really popular one with students that um, you might find useful. Um, the next section there is just sort of a hodgepodge of uh, educational resources, activities, um, assets that might be useful for you. They're mostly related to uh, either the Mississippi River in particular or rivers and watersheds in general. And I will note that the National Geographic Resource Library is very large and has lots of assets. So if there's something in particular that you're looking for, um, you can do a keyword search into the resource library and see um, if we have something for you there. So the next link um, on the participant agenda is UNEP's Clean Seas Resources. And there you'll find um, education packs and other resources around plastics that might be useful to you as you're planning. And then the last link there is the um, Outdoor Education Collective website. So this is a site run by teachers and you'll see there's lots of resources on how to use the outdoors as a learning space, um, lots of videos, lesson plans, activities on, um, on outdoor education. So that might be useful to you uh, as well and could at least help jog your thinking as you're thinking about how to integrate this project into uh, your students' learning. Um, so I'll pause there. Let's see, yes, I will repost the participant agenda. Are there any other questions about the resources? I think we're good. Thank you, Carly. Right. I was looking for it I, to yeah. try to get that agenda on there. Yeah, sometimes it's hard with all the tabs to find. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so now we are on to by far the best part of today's session, uh, which is hearing from other educators. Um, so like I said, this past spring, um, was a pilot initiative in, in St. Louis, St. Paul and Baton Rouge. So we're really grateful um, to Katie and Britt from, for um, not only participating in the initiative, but also sharing what they learned uh, with all of you and helping us make this initiative stronger. Um, so Katie and Britt both integrated this project into the, their students' learning. They're gonna tell us about their experiences. So Katie, I will turn it over to you first. Awesome. Thank you, Carly. Uh, first off, reiterate what Brett said. Um, anybody out there, it is much simpler than it may sound. Um, I know that when I first started thinking about the project, I think I found out about it in March. Um, and I teach high school at St. Joseph Academy. I was nervous about like, how is this going to work? Are we going to do it right? Like, what if our data is not good? Um, and then once we got out there the first time, I realized like it's all good. Like we are collecting data and this is a very worthwhile purpose. And still kids are coming up to me now that did it last year and are like, hey, Mrs. Lotus, whatever happened with that? So I'm really excited tomorrow to get to go back and mention to them that, hey, there's other people we're growing from what you all did. So just a few things to, to share and then absolutely people can you know ask questions or, or do whatever is, is best for you all. I can pull this up. Um, I do teach at St. Joseph's Academy and I kind of put it at the bottom. Um, we are in suburban St. Louis, so we're in the Mississippi watershed, but we have quite a few little watersheds to get us, the Two Mile Creek and then Deer Creek, um, to get us actually to the Mississippi River. And um, so we didn't collect at school, but a cool thing is that Britt has and will. So you guys are going to hear some amazing things that she has done. And um, we use this as, um, it wasn't actually used in class last year. Um, use it. I'm the Earth Angels moderator, so like our environmental club, and then our science club, Beta Chi Pi, also jumped on, and then we have a group of students that are in global education. So we kind of opened it up to lots of different folks um, to do this. We wanted to go out three times in April. We ended up going out two, but that was that was okay too. So the first, um, we picked two different locations. So um, John, I know you had mentioned like how do you find it. Um, we went ahead of time, so we kind of planned because it is student drivers. Um, and we did this outside of school. So we did this on the weekends. Um, they had to have permission slips and all that good stuff. Um, so we picked first a, a pretty trendy neighborhood in St. Louis. So if anybody wants to come down and visit, Lafayette Square's got some great food. 
um, and pretty cool area to be in. It has a park in the middle of it and then um, a lot of housing, but then kind of outside of it is more, um, I would say, open for development type area. So it was just a group of a few students that decided to come down. Um, so these are the students we're looking at and we kind of went off in two directions. So found out, as Britt said, they know what they're doing way more than we do. <laughs> was, you know, the, there were two teachers with me and we're like trying to put the data in and finally we're like, what are we even doing? Let's just enjoy and take pictures of them because they're doing all the good stuff. So they could be on the phone, get their data uploaded in no time at all. And we did use one, um, one username. So we kind of did that at a school to kind of keep all the data together so we could look at it. So they just logged on as, as our school data name that we looked at. Um, but again, from the park, you know, picked up some pretty amazing things or interesting things. Our data looks like it was about the same as kind of overall with it. So one of the great things about this program um, that both Jenny and Jenna mentioned is that the data is there, like it's open source data. So we can grab it whenever we want. Um, a couple of the math teachers this year even said, hey, there was that thing you did last year. Can we just use this just to show students how to graph? So they're graphing something worthwhile um, and talking about like a pie graph versus a bar graph versus a line graph. This isn't really line graph data. So um, there's some really nice little curriculum um, connections there that was outside of what I was thinking of doing with it. Um, so students saw that mostly it was cigarette butts um, that they were looking at. And at first they were going for every little tiny piece until reminded them that like we be, should be doing inch by inch that we were looking at. Um, and that was the Monday after Easter. So um, the park had been pretty crowded that day. And then we picked a completely different area. So we went up to the confluence of the Mississippi and the Missouri River. And this was um, a Missouri conservation area. So it's, it's used for conservation. Um, we actually went along the Mississippi River and in the picture on the left and the picture in the middle is on the Missouri River. Um, it was great because they're out there and every, there's a lot of folks fishing. I know you can only see there's one gentleman up in the upper left but everyone wanted to know what we were doing. So this was even better. So like showed them the app, showed them what was happening. And then they're all like, yeah, there's stuff all over the place. So it started a conversation um, that was not only good for the folks that were on the river, but also good for our students because then they were starting to communicate and you know be advocates. So again, a little kind of addition that didn't plan on, but worked out really, really well as we went through that. And that we had similar, a lot of cigarette butts, but a lot of plastic wrappers. People are sitting on the bank fishing on their Sunday afternoon. And this was a Sunday that we went there. Um, but I love that it's both bar graph and also a pie chart to kind of show what's happening. And as Britt mentioned, and she'll mention again, it's really easy to get to the data. So putting the data in laptop or a cell phone, but um, accessing it and graphing, it seems a little bit easier on like a, a laptop or some kind of personal computer platform. And it's very easy to navigate between the two. And we were lucky enough to have Jenny, who was awesome, that uh, zoomed in with the class and kind of talked about the project. So similar to what started off today. And that also got the students a little bit more fired up and they realized that their data was important. Although I think anytime you put National Geographic and, and the United Nations and the University of Georgia and the MRCTI, like people kind of sit up. Um, a lot of parents contacted me like, hey, what is this? What can we be part of this? So um, I think it helped get the, get the word out there with it. And you can download, I just grabbed a couple screenshots, but you can download your data or you can download the data from the actual place that you are at. So it could be like everyone's data. It's really very visually pleasing what it shows up, um, what you collected, what the most was, and has you know some little icons that folks can use. Um, there's a student that I have now that is doing a water quality project and she wants to access the data from where she is to kind of bring up, hey, these are things that are ending up in the water and, and what's going on with that. So again, lots more information if you want it. There's plenty of um, <laughs> numbers that you can crunch if that's the deal. Um, but there's also, you know, more, um, more connections, I guess you'll say. So like Britt does some pretty, pretty cool stuff. And we did this all on our phones um, because the students have phones. Um, so we didn't use um, a spreadsheet because it seemed a little bit faster for us, but we also didn't have privacy issues. So the students were okay. They were all you know, 14 and above. And so it wasn't a problem with them, with them logging on. So I will put my email in the chat. I know I was quick, but um, kind of, I think it's one of those things. It's how you want to use it, but I'm absolutely open to anyone who has questions now or forever to, to get hold of me and chat about how I used it. 
um, or what I thought was was beneficial. But I would say um, if you're using it in your school, let your other teachers know because there's always these little connections. And anytime students can be talking about the same project in multiple um, classrooms, I think it's just more um, worthwhile for them. But does anyone have any questions? All right, then I will press, pass it on to Britt and she can uh, share some pretty cool stuff. Thank you. So I am Britt Tate Bogard and I am an art teacher in North St. Louis. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my PowerPoint. Let me see if I, look at me, I'm so proud of myself sometimes. It's the little things like when things work, it's like, especially when, if, cause if you do it wrong, then kids just yell at you. So anyway, all right. Um, so this is a photo of Brian Hill Elementary is back here in the background. And then this is actually an outdoor maker space that we've created this school year. Um, so, I do a lot of art based in sustainable practices and I do a lot of upcycling and repurposing and reducing and reusing and so on and so forth. So we've done a lot with green schools and we've done a lot with different challenges um, to sort of address environmental racism and things like that. Um, so this project I don't even know how I ended up going to the Zoom originally to learn about all of it, but I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And, you know, we're always kind of geeking out about trash and things like that. So what better than to learn how to do this? So I went to the training and everything, put the app on my phone, and then realized that I work with three to 11-year-olds and I needed to adapt it myself. Um, to work with our student body. So one of the things that we were really working on last year with COVID in mind was this idea of community and really trying to establish a strong community. I think that so many of our kids being out of school and when learning from home and just all of the things that went with that, it really it amplified how important a school is to a community. And we also have recently been going through school closings and things like that. And so this, this sense of community was really big. And um, we were really trying to link kids more to their actual neighborhood and community. So my students all live for the most part in the College Hill neighborhood in North St. Louis. And so this was a really great way for them to track things and to help make them more visually aware of trash that they see. I think a lot of times they've gotten so used to it just being there that this really forced them to stop and look about what was there. Um, and, and it really also helped quantify it. So Ms. Tate can stand there and tell you like how messy the world is, but until you really are looking at it and seeing it for yourself, you know, I mean, you, you just, you don't really think about it. And I do, I think that these kids are very much just used to seeing it everywhere. Um, we actually in the city right now are having a massive issue with trash because we're very, very shorthanded on um, garbage truck drivers and this, that, and the other, and all of our city amenities. And so, dumpsters aren't getting picked up as often. And we don't really have a lot of trash cans in the North city. And so debris just blows everywhere and we don't have trees. So there's nothing to even slow down the wind. So this just was like so timely in so many ways. Um, so we had, to get we had to get creative and come up with a way of tracking this for kids. Um, because at the beginning, the tracker looked a little different than it does now. Um, and so when I started, the tracker changed in about the middle of when I was tracking. Um, and so the other thing that we really did is across the street from my school was this vacant lot that the city owned. 
and we were all forced to go back into the schools and you know everyone was like well it'd be fine because you just use your outdoor learning space and I was like there's no outdoor learning space at my school there's a blacktop with playground equipment that we're not even allowed to use. So we noticed that there was this vacant lot. Um, so we started cleaning it up. We started mowing it. We started picking up trash. And then up in the corner, you will see a drone photo of what we have built over there. It is now um, five different outdoor classrooms with nine garden beds. There's a stage, a puppet stage. Um, these multi, these little round tires, um, colorful tires are actually little seats and there's a little um, free little library. There's a giant geodesic dome because um, the botanical gardens has been a huge partner with us. So I really wanted to mimic that geodesic dome that's so iconic to the botanical gardens. Um, and then this other corner, there is what we call the sound garden, which is just pots and pans that have been spray painted for kids to bang on. Um, there's two pianos and then lots of gardening and things like that. So, you know, part of what the kids have had to do is help keep that space clean also. So it's been like so awesome. So this is our trash tracker that is super low tech and it's literally just a sheet of copy paper and a bunch of pictures. Um, and then the kids just, everyone took a trash tracker home and we talked about being safe because it's not exactly a neighborhood where you want to like send kids out into wandering around and stuff like that. So we were like, track while you're standing and waiting for the school bus, track while you're walking to and from the school bus. Or if you're a kid who walks to and from school, just kind of track as you're walking to and from school. So kids took home the trash tracker and then they filled it out. And, and I would either let them you know, sometimes I would just be like, we'll bring it back tomorrow. And then there's other times I was like, oh, keep it for a week or take it home over the weekend and things like that. So I got it. I got back all different kinds of tracker. But this was a way that my students of all ages could see culturally relevant and reflective like images um, so that even if they couldn't read like the word liquor bottle, bottle, like they know what that bottle is and same with lids, cigarette butts and things like that. So I just really needed to keep it, um, keep it, keep it real for my students. Um, and then occasionally we would take walks and, um, our fifth graders tracked tr all trash that we picked up from the outdoor learning space. So, I mean, it was really cool. And, and like this tracker is not fancy at all, but it totally worked. And, you know, the kids, there was no question about what they were tracking. And I told them if they saw other weird things to just write it on the back or draw a picture of it on the back, because the tracker has so many things that I just was like, these are the big ones. So I just wanted to make sure tires, especially are a huge one um, and foam and plastic takeaway. Um, so this sort of gives you an idea. These little stars and stuff are working on dissertation research. And so I have these things marked on the map so you can just disregard those. But um, my school, as you can see, is right up here um, in North City. Uh, and then we actually ended up tracking um, 4,582 items. And I, I hadn't really seen it with all the other data to realize that we were like the fifth most collected um, group, which is not bad for an art teacher and 145 kids in North City, St. Louis, I'm pretty proud to say. Um, the funny thing is because of the way that they tracked it and the way I had to input the data, um, it looks like we collected it all from two spots and those two spots are the school and the parking lot at my kid's school. Because a lot of times I was just sitting, which is just, you know, a mile up West Florissant. But a lot of times it was me sitting with all of these pieces of paper, like tracking it and inputting it into my phone from while I was waiting on my kids to come out to the car. Um, so, you know, our sort of now what, um, the plan is now to keep doing what we were doing you know, we're back this year and I 
sort of let the kids have a little time before I hit them with this kind of really intense um, tracking again, because we need to really meet our students where they are. Uh, and right now we're very much in a social, emotional repair and recover time, I'll say. Uh, so there, I think it's a little daunting to like all of a sudden be like, welcome back to school. Here's a whole new curriculum and your neighborhood's full of trash. So, um, you know, I'm really just kind of trying to ease them back into it. Um, but they definitely already know kind of what's going on because they've been out in the outdoor learning space. So they're like, Hey, Miss Tate, there's a lot of this or, or things that they notice now too, is when there's not a lot of something, you know, as we've had that outdoor learning space and we've built this community around the space and we've, we've opened it up so that residents, so it's not just a school thing. It's for anyone who lives in the College Hill neighborhood and like families come over and eat dinner there at night. Cause it's a great little park almost for parents to sit. We have like really comfortable chairs so parents can sit and their kids can like do their thing. We've seen like families eating dinner there at night. I mean, it's so charming, but the kids have noticed that the communities help take care of it also. So they've noticed that there's not as much trash on the ground because we've provided a lot of trash cans around the area and people are just picking up. We leave um, different like trash picker upper, like gripper things and stuff like that for community members to use if they're, if they want to, you know, sometimes they do. Other times I found like really weird and gross things um, at the school garden. It is a very romantic place apparently and people like to do adult extracurricular activities there. Um, so, you know, you learn a lot when you start tracking the trash in your neighborhood, <laughs> but um, it's been a really cool experience um, to sort of look at the, the social justice aspect of the, the tracker, so. That's amazing, thank you, Brett. And, um... We had a, a request for your contact info, so if you could drop that into the chat to everyone, that would be great. Thank you both so much. That was amazing. I love how you sort of taken this initiative and really um, localized it to what your students are going through and what they need. Absolutely um, amazing. Um, so I am cognizant of time, so I think now we'll... Um, We'll move briefly to talk about social media. So we do want to make sure you stay connected with, with us. We want to um, see what you do and hear uh, how it goes with your students. So I'm gonna pass it over to Jane to just briefly go through our social media um, assets. Jane? Thank, thank you, Carly. And thank you everyone for sharing these amazing stories. I was just emailing our director that we're just so excited to see how this initiative has really grown at the grassroots level. And she unfortunately wasn't able to make the meeting, but the United Nations Environment Program has been really invested in this. We've gained a lot of attention from our global community. So your work really makes an impact, not only in your local town and city and in the U.S., but and the global level, it's really well received and people are taking action. So thank you. Um, for social media, which is a whole other segment, um, we created a Trello board, which I recognize is a bit confusing for those who have not used Trello, but really it's a web link that just puts all of our social media materials and outreach materials into one spot. So I'll pop the link in the chat. I'm sure you've already seen it before but we basically break it out into different sections of our key messages, our um, pictures, videos, links that you can share. We also include some things that you would not use necessarily for social media, but just general outreach, like our flyer and our fact sheet and some key stats and figures and our infographic. So all of the materials there are for you to use however you wish and to share wherever you want and really to just mobilize people to join and take part in the initiative. So it's basically broken up into different sections. The third one's the most important with the key messaging and we've drafted some social media posts that you can share to your own channels, but use it however you'd like. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to any of us, but I'm available over email as well and I'll send it in the chat. Thanks.
Thank you, Jane. And um, Jenny, are there any sort of like closing reminders for the group about dates or anything like that we need to keep in mind? Yeah, so um, our goal is to get as much data as, as we can collected between October 1st and October 31st in the Quad Cities um, and get, you know, Britt, I love your list. So I'd like to get that out. I think we have uh, Glenda and John and the other folks that registered your email addresses that we can send those to. And I'll copy the folks on this call on that email so that you can reach out to anybody on here. Um, it's just a great opportunity to get the kids out to show they can see what they do, they can see what their group is doing, what the community is doing, what the St. Louis area or Quad Cities area is doing, and then build and build and build. And it's it's really great. And that awareness factor, like you said, I mean, even when I, I've always been in this field, but even when I started doing the tracker, when I walk around, I notice things uh, now, you know, and what are the most common things? And that's the, that's very critical. But I want to see John and Glenda, do you have any questions, concerns? Um, any, do you need anything from us at this point? No, oh, this is Glenda Gusta. I, hey, it's great. I, I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad to be a part of this. This is something new that our uh, NAACP uh, group has started here locally with the environmental group. So I've been trying to get as much as I can, learn as much as I can so I can take it back to our community. So thank you so much. That's fine. That's great. Yeah. And I'll send you this information and feel free to reach out anytime. John, do you have any questions or comments, concerns? No, I just appreciate everybody coming out and uh, some some great success stuff in St. Louis. That's awesome to see what you guys are doing. Uh, hope, hoping we're planning to start with the Ecology Club and then hopefully branch out and get more high school students involved. So yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll uh, get mobilized. Excellent. All right. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone so much for joining. Many thanks to our presenters, especially Britt and Katie. Thank you for spending your time and sharing what you've learned. We really appreciate it. Um, like Jenny said, we're here. Please contact us if you have uh, any questions and thanks for your time tonight. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you. Bye folks. Bye-bye.